Aloha and welcome to I Teach 808, Empowering Hawaii's Teachers and Technology Content, sponsored by the Augustine Educational Foundation and Sacred Hearts Academy Honolulu. My name is David Nino Mia, and I'll be facilitating this session. We are so honored to have Amanda Strawhacker join us today and share her expertise through a 45 minute presentation named Introducing Robotics in the Early Years, Tools and Tips. Please be aware that we'll be recording this session. If you don't like being recorded, you may consider turning off the camera during the session or reviewing the recording afterwards. The recording will be made available on YouTube and shared on iTeach 808's website for a week after this event. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Amanda. Thank you so much. Um, so if you're here for introducing robotics in the early years, you're in the right place. I'll talk in just a moment or two about what specifically I'm gonna share with you today. But I also just want to say thank you so much to the I Teach 808 sponsors, Augustine Educational Foundation and Sacred Hearts Academy for making it possible for people like me who are calling in from uh, actually snowy Boston right now to be able to share and learn with all of you all in Hawaii. And I also wanted to remind you all about the attendee survey. This is so cool that they're doing this. You have a chance to win one of 20 Target gift cards just for completing a really quick survey. So don't forget to head over to iteach808.com to complete that and enter your name in the sweepstakes. And without further ado, I'll get started. So my name is Dr. Amanda Strawhacker. I have a doctorate in child study and human development from Tufts University in Boston, where I work as the associate director of a graduate program here, basically running professional development like this. I help practitioners and uh, museum educators and edu educators in schools and administrators learn how to integrate technology, engineering, and robotics from a very early age around pre-K to second grade is sort of my experience level. Uh, and my entire, um, I would say my passion in my work is helping children uh, from all backgrounds start from a very early age feeling welcome and included in STEAM education. So that's just integrated science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. So today I'm really excited to share with you. Um, very briefly, I'm gonna try to, if you're not already sold on the idea of robotics for very young kids, I'm gonna give you a couple um, thinking points for maybe flexing your thinking, or if you're already uh, interested in robotics for early childhood, maybe this will reinforce what you already believe or know. I'm gonna spend the bulk of the time thinking about how we can introduce robotics in an early age in a developmentally appropriate way that captures the curiosity and the hearts of young children in a way that really speaks to them um, for you know, meeting them where they live, making it very accessible, very hands-on and approachable. And for the, for the majority of the talk, I'm gonna share with you two of the kids' very favorite toys that they play with here at the Makerspace at Tufts that I helped create for early childhood, the Coda Pillar and the Bebot Robot. I'm gonna share with you the hardware, the software, and give you a taste of some of the activities that we run in our Makerspace that the kids have responded really well to. So let's get started. If you do not already explore robotics in early childhood, um, or really even any kinds of technology or engineering or, or general STEM education, um, I encourage you to check it out because there are there's a lot of evidence that for um, very young kids, actually, we start to see them developing, even at age four and five, some stereotypes about who is able to participate, who's invited in STEM later on in life. And by exposing them to curricula, to educators, to uh, you know, tools and kits like we're gonna talk about today, we actually see that they limit their stereotype formation later on in life. So it actually helps them feel welcome. Children from all backgrounds, girls, under underrepresented minorities, um, can feel more welcome for the duration of life by starting very young, involving them in STEM. Uh, robotics is especially a very fun way to work with young children in STEM because it's so playful. You know, you get to pick it up, you get to break things apart and put them back together. It's very hands-on necessarily because it involves hardware. Uh, and it's a great way to introduce the foundations of computer science and engineering, provided you're picking tools and activities that are developmentally appropriate, which we'll talk about in just a second. And from a cognitive perspective, and even from a social perspective, there are so many domains that robotics can support in young children and young learners. 
primarily sequencing, I think, is a really core one that the research shows. Um, it, it's sequencing, you know, the idea that there's an order to things, that the order matters, that we can change the order and then change the outcome of what happens in our to-do lists or our recipe lists or our coding instructions, for example. And that's sort of foundational to literacy, to math, um, to all kinds of academic domains, as well as the range of other cognitive areas that development or that robotics supports, like critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, fine motor skills, social interactions. So all of these domains can be supported by introducing fun and novel tools that young children have the opportunity to play with. For any of the tools that you might be exploring in early childhood, I just want to start with a couple tips right off the bat for how you can engage young children. Um, you might first want to start by thinking about how to teach what robots are beyond just introducing them and thinking about how to code them. Because a lot of children won't have exposure to robots beyond maybe media or television. So there are some really great books out there. I have just a couple on the screen here pictured for you, um, but there are also some wonderful resources. And I'm gonna share at the end some teaching guides that you can use that are created by the companies that put out Codepillar and Bebot, just as examples of how to teach what robots are. And uh, I personally like the definition that they are machines that humans created that we can code or program or basically give instructions to tell them what to do. So they're not living, they're machines. That's an important distinction for young children. Uh, and we can control them to make uh, certain actions or interact with the environment or do helpful things for us. I also love to involve physical games and songs to learn about robot parts and robot actions. Um, so if you're thinking that directional actions are where you want to start. These two kits I'm going to show you are perfect for that. A lot of robots do start with just walking and moving through space. Um, and remember that young children are still figuring out the difference between left and right. That comes up a lot with these kits. So, you know, remember your tricks where if you um, have English speaking students, you can use your left hand to make an L and help children remember it that way. You can come up with other tricks. Um, maybe the right hand always has a hair tie. Um, but whatever you do, remember that the best way to help children is to get them actually moving their own bodies. So maybe we move with our, our own bodies the way that we want to predict our robots will move or the way that we want to code our robots to move. Make sure that when you do introduce coding activities, try to provide opportunities for every child to take a turn holding and coding the robot individually. I know that sounds like a lot to ask, especially when a lot of the activities that are really best for early childhood are actually social group activities, maybe working in teams of two or three. And we, I do really strongly encourage you to focus on collaborative ways to play. But one of the best quotes that I ever heard by um, my, my PhD advisor, actually, Dr. Marina Bears at Tufts, is that we don't expect children to learn how to write by asking them to share a pencil. So why would we expect them to learn to code by asking them to always share a robot? So at some point, it's really important for children to feel like they're in control of the experience and to make sure that they get a turn holding and coding the robot. And finally, when things don't go the way you expected, that's actually a great opportunity to, um, to iterate, to revisit your, maybe you are teaching the engineering design process with your students. I could give a whole other webinar on that. Or maybe you're just thinking of ways to build perseverance with your students. Failures with robotics happen a lot. It's just part of the territory. And it's a great opportunity to work together and model with your children and think about what you can do to improve your bug or situation that uh, might be causing some frustration. So those are just some overall tips. Now I'm going to dive right into these tools that I brought for you today. So I have two, actually three, but I'll talk about the other two in a moment. First, we have Codapillar. I have a Codapillar here for you to see. Um, Codapillar is a robotic, it, it looks like a caterpillar, caterpillar shaped toy created by Fisher Price that uses a motorized head. So actually, I'm going to pull the rest of the body off. And you can see how the head actually has some robotic components inside. It has a port for batteries and it has an on switch. Codapillar makes a lot of noise. So just know that going in. Um, it's really, really popular with our two to three year old set of learners, primarily because it's so interactive. It lights up, it sings, and it's really easy to code. So Codapillar has some components 
that snap and pull apart, just like I just showed you with the head. And the order that you attach them is the order that they're going to move the robot. They light up as they move so you can see which action you're on. Um, and Caterpillar also sells, uh, along with the whole kit, two little pads. I don't have the pads here with me today, but they look just like little coffee coasters, I think. Um, and they aren't interactive or digital. They're just reminders of starting and stopping landmarks for children to try to plan their routes. If you're thinking of investing in a Coda pillar, you can find them online for about $45, although all robotics kits seem to be out of stock lately for um, post-holiday rush, I think. So you might want to get this on your inventory list for your school early if you're thinking about starting with it next year. The basic kit comes with uh, a few of these very um, straightforward directional um, actions, and I can show you them here as well. There's a couple forwards, some left and right, and there's also a noise or like a little sing at the end. You can change the order by detaching them and reattaching them and putting them on the head. And then there's a green, or sorry, a blue power button that when you press it, Coda Pillar will start driving around your room. There are also some extension packs if you're curious about those. You can add some sounds. Again, this is going to be really popular with your youngest set of kids because the interactivity, the fact that the robot lights up and makes noise is very novel and very engaging for them. So if you can stand the loud noise, <laughs> they really, really enjoy it. Um, and if they get a little bit older, this is, it's interesting to me that Coda Pillar has introduced this because I personally think it's really great for a toddler age range, um, but they've introduced some partial spin blocks or uh, I guess components. So you can um, turn 180 degrees or a full, you know, turn, turn to face your back or a 45 degree, which is kind of like turn just a little bit, not all the way to your right. Um, personally, I think those are interesting choices because I don't know anyone who teaches Cartesian coordinate degree planes before third grade. So it might be a good way to extend the life of your kit if you're working in, for example, a K-5 setting and you wanna introduce the Coda Pillar for a very specific activity. I'm not sure that the young children will really understand the degree idea, but they might like the power to sort of fine tune the, tune, the turns. But I know that these six that I'm circling now, the, the sounds and the left, right and straight are very, very popular accessories. If you're not sure that you want to invest in the hardware, but you want to explore the, the, the interaction of Coda Pillar and even the sounds before you buy, they do actually have a free app. You can download it for iOS and Android, and I believe Chromebook. Uh, and when you download it, it has a number of different like levels that you can sort of play through. And basically, um, a lot of coding apps have a very similar setup these days where they have sort of a drawer of options on the right side of the screen and a little task, a challenge to navigate code of pillar around a, an environment. And they ask you to drag these arrows onto the code of pillar so that you can give your coded instructions. Now, personally, I actually think that the beauty of the robotic coded pillar kit is that it's so tactile and it's, you know, it's very open-ended. It's sort of a sandbox and you kind of learn how to use it through trial and error. But if you have slightly older kids or kids who love coded pillar, but are maybe aging out of it, this might be a nice way to engage them with an on-screen option. So for an activity, because it looks like a caterpillar, I mean, <laughs> one of the, sort of positives and negatives about children's robots at this age range is that they make them look very, very specific. So it does call to mind really particular things. Uh, I've seen a lot of kids immediately jump to thinking about The Very Hungry Caterpillar, the Eric Carle classic book. Um, and there are lots of opportunities out there to just see how other people have run this activity online. Here you can see an example of how you might lay out some um, pictures from the book. So the caterpillar is driving to one apple and then one to, uh, two pears. You can um, see along the top, there are provocations that they've put for the child to um, decorate their own coda pillar or decorate their own butterfly. And if you wanted to get even a little bit more detailed with the planning stage of this activity, I've seen people put together some really awesome planning sheets. So on the left, this is a planning sheet someone made where instead of a straight line, they actually used um, little paper icons for their foods and they placed them all around the room on a grid system and asked the children to draw arrows to map their path 
and use that as a sort of a plan for how they might code their code of color. Another uh, teacher that I saw online used um, some really cool printed paper icons. So actually, this picture, you can actually find this just by Googling code of pillar, um, code of pillar images or code of pillar blocks or coding instructions. And they created a little activity for their kids where they had a range of these sort of to choose from and they got to tape them in, an, in order in the way that they wanted to see their code of pillar move. So that's actually a really, I really love focusing on the planning stage when you're building a code, especially because it gives you a great opportunity to go back and debug or revise when you're troubleshooting or the robot did something that you didn't expect. It's a great opportunity to say, well, let's take a look at your plan and see where it might have changed from what you thought would happen. You can run the robot again and again. You can change your plan and compare plans. So I think that's a really nice uh, opportunity. So that's everything I had about Code of Pillar. If you had more questions about Code of Pillar, please do put your questions in the chat. I'd love to hear from you guys what your thoughts are, what you're thinking about, or if you already use Code of Pillar in your setting. But now I'm going to transition to Bbot. So Bbot actually, um, it has fewer parts. So hardware wise, it's a little bit um, less of the physical construction that you get out of the Code of Pillar and more of the real focus of thinking about the code. So Bbot also has a little um, switch on the bottom. One difference that Bbot has that Codepillar does not is that you can turn the sound on and off too. So if you're working in a busy classroom and this is a center activity, that might be a helpful thing to have for you. Although some kids really do like the, the sound of hearing the gears kind of turn. And I can turn it on for you and just run a simple program. All of Bbot's coding instructions are on its body, just like Codepillar, but instead of attachments that you construct, they're actually buttons on the body. So there's similarly just simple directional buttons. That's actually all that Bbot does. And you push the buttons in a sequence in order to make your robot code. So I'm going to make a little code for us now. I'm going to go forward, forward, backward. And you saw the eyes light up. It's got my code, but it's not going to do anything until I push the green go button. So now I'm going to put it on the table and show you what it looks like. So you can see it rolls. It has this really satisfying mechanical sound to it when it moves. It's eyes light up every time it moves and they shine left and right when it's done its sequence. Now, the one interesting thing about Bbot is that if I were to keep adding more arrows, it would actually add it on to that original code that I created, which is kind of interesting, different from a lot of robot kits. So what you want to do if you want to start a new program is press this X to clear it. And again, you'll see the, the eyes lighting up. Uh, if you wanted to work on something, the nice thing about being able to add on to your sequence is that you can, for example, continue building a program step by step as you go. So let's say you're trying to help your students navigate something all the way across the room and they have a really long way to go and they want to do it in chunks. You can actually test out just a little bit of your code at a time and then, okay, that worked. Let's just try one more forward and see how far we get and start back at the beginning and, and you can sort of iterate that way on your design. Bbot's a little different than Coda Pillar in terms of price. It retails for about $80. Uh, and I think they also have classroom kits that are in the five to 550 to 600 range that get six um, Bbots altogether and maybe some classroom materials that I'll talk about in just a second. But the only other um, block, uh, button that that I wanted to tell you about is the travel, pardon me, the pause button. So Bbot has a pause button that actually lets you stop its movement in the middle of its code. If I'm being honest with you, I don't, I obviously don't work for these companies. I've never seen it work successfully. I don't think it registers or you might have to touch it at exactly the right time. So I usually just ignore the pause button. We can try right now and see if it will work. I don't know. Maybe I just have a broken robot, but I've heard the same from other people. So <laughs> the travel pause button, maybe a little bit um, more 
of an advertisement than anything else. But the other five buttons or six buttons usually do work pretty much exactly as advertised. Bebot also has a lot of accessories that come with it. So my favorite accessory is the card mat that you can see on the left. It actually looks like, and, and you could actually make one of these yourself, but what I like about the Bebot mat is that it has the baseboard mat is uh, white with sort of checkerboards all over it. It's exactly the distance of one Bebot movement. And on top, it has a uh, sort of a plastic overlay. So you can actually lift the clear plastic and put things underneath that you want Bebot to be traveling on top of or around. And I'll show you at the end why I think that's a really cool feature. But right here, you can see these children are using um, the mats as a maze activity. So their teacher has pulled together some black uh, pieces of construction paper. Those are areas where Bebot's not supposed to go. So how can we navigate Bebot around those spots? One other detail about Bebot that I think is important to note is that the turn is a little bit different than you might expect, especially because it's supposed to work on this grid system. So where Caterpillar, when it starts to turn, it just begins moving in that direction, like a train that's sort of taking a, a track off to the right. Let me show you what happens when we code Bebot. I'm gonna clear my program to move forward and then turn and not move forward anymore. Let's see what that looks like. So as you can see, if I were to turn Bebot once within this, this mat, it would actually be in the same exact square where it started. So now we need to help children think about not just orienting our direction, but actually moving a number of steps forward from that direction also. So because this mat idea, the grid square works so well for Bebot, they actually have a number of other grids that you can purchase on their website. They have an alphabet mat that's really popular. I think I've seen it in other languages besides English, but I know their English one is very popular. They also have a number of sort of fantastical scenes. So this is the farm scene. There's um, like a dragon and dungeon scene. Um, I think I've seen a uh, winter scene. To be honest, those are sort of just fun to have. I think the mat really allows for so much, the, uh, the plain card mat on the left allows for so much creativity that you almost don't need those kinds of other commercial mats, but I have seen a lot of teachers who really enjoyed those as well. Uh, finally, I wanted to point out, so one other distinction between Caterpillar, Caterpillar uses uh, batteries that you would insert at the bottom of the head. Bebot actually uses um, a USB charging cord that you attach to the bottom of the robot. And you just need to make sure you have a USB box to, or um, a cube to attach to an outlet. It also has these really awesome coding cards. Now, because the code of Bebot lives basically in the robot's brain <laughs> inside the computer, and you can't really see what you're coding unless you press go or you remember, and that taxes the working memory of a lot of children. They have these cards that help you sort of plan out what you want Bebop to do. And the cool thing about the cards is that in addition to telling you what the actual action is, they highlight, it's a little bit hard to see, but they highlight in white the button that corresponds with that action. So if you're working with your children and you wanna plan out a big activity, you could even use these cards in a large group or a, maybe a smaller group activity, um, but they would all, they're also, they come with so many that you can have children work individually as well and do a similar kind of um, workshop style planning event like we were talking about with Caterpillar where you're planning your route. You could also imagine putting these under the Bebot card mat, for example, because the card mat really does provide endless opportunities for fun. Something cool about Bebot is the um, alternative version of Bebot that they put out, which is Bluebot. Bluebot is actually exactly like Bebot. It has all the same functionality, doesn't do anything different, except it has this clear casing, which is sort of, I think, really nice because it's rooted in a philosophy that we talk a lot about at my research group at Tufts, the DevTech research group, which is that we should be inviting children to look under the hood of these robots. Remember what I was saying earlier, it's important to teach them what robots are in addition to how they work and what they do. 
When you can see inside the robot, they can trace their fingers along the wires. They can look at the wheels and how they connect to the computer. They can look at the light bulbs. It's all of a sudden, it's a really, um, it's a great tool for exploration about what this robot is in addition to how to move it. So you might present it at your science center, for example, with some magnifying glasses and see what children notice when they explore the interior of the robot. Bluebot also is unique because, and you may have gotten this from the name, it is Bluetooth enabled. So there are, again, apps for both Bbot and Bluebot that you could explore if you wanted to just see how they move and see what the, they even simulate the sounds in the app. It's actually, it's really clever. Um, and again, they have little maps that you can follow. But the Bluebot app has a little bit more functionality because you can actually control the robot from the tablet screen. So if you had, for example, some three and four year olds who were really um, mastering Bbot or even two year olds who are exploring Bbot and they were starting to graduate out of it, your four, fives and sixes might enjoy Bluebot because they can then use a tablet or Chromebook or um, uh, Android device to come up with their codes and they have different kinds of modes in the, the Bluebot app. So they have explorer mode where you can sort of do whatever you want and just control from your remote control device. They have challenge modes where they've come up with a number of challenges for you, for the children to sort of explore um, without any materials necessary. And they also have um, controller mode. And similarly to the, the Bebot app, controller mode kind of lets them navigate through a, a few different um, specific challenges. And if you didn't have a device and you didn't have a robot and you just kind of want to see what this is before you shell out 80 bucks or ask your school to buy you a kit, they actually have a free website emulator of Bebot. You can just go to the website and start clicking around and seeing how it works. And just like the Bebot, it's going to make you click the arrows in a certain order and then press go before the robot begins to move. And they use their alphabet mat as the example of how it works. Um, but the Bebot emulator is actually, it's a fun way to just sort of explain what Bebot is before you buy it. But it also might be a good way to introduce to your children if you're using screens in your setting um, for free, what a robot is and does or what a coding language is and does. And also just a way to introduce what these arrows do and mean and how they interact with movement in space. So that's another website resource for you. Okay, so an activity, just another, um, fun activity that might come up for you in your space. This is super, super popular in our makerspace. These are actually kids from our makerspace. We're playing Bebot scavenger hunt. So we have a card mat and we, <laughs> this is a, another researcher and I came up with this on the fly. We had about 30 minutes of unscheduled time with some children who were participating in a study. And we thought, what are we gonna do that doesn't require any setup? We just got some post-its. I think we had some stickers and we drew some funny pictures on the top of the post-it. And on the bottom, we asked them some trivia questions or some, some robot related games and activities. So the examples over here are real ones that we've used. Um, true or false robots are alive. True or false motors help robots move or do a robot dance or tell us your favorite robot joke. Things to sort of lighten the mood. And the way the game works is every child gets a turn. Remember, I always recommend every child at least having one opportunity to build and co code the robot on their own. Every ch child gets a turn. We start the robot somewhere random on the mat and they pick their favorite image. So if we had stickers on the top of our, um, of our sticky notes, maybe they would pick the rainbow that's maybe over here in the corner. And then collectively, we all talk about what needs to happen. What would we need to code into Bebot to get Bebot to move all the way from where it currently is all the way over to where our rainbow goal is. And the greatest thing about this game is that it really um, encourages trial and error because we want to make sure that kids don't feel frustrated. I mean, it is still a fun game after all. So we give them lots of opportunity. We let them test and retest. And if they want, we let them ask for help from their friends. Um, if they want to work on it alone, we give them one or two tries for that as well. And if they really can't get it and they're just having a really hard time, then we ask their friends if it's okay if we bookmark the rainbow because we know Taylor is so excited about it. And maybe we could pick different exciting uh, stick stickies when it gets to our turn. Honestly, it hasn't happened that much because almost every time the kids collaborate and figure out a way to get to the, the goal together. And then it's a, a fun activity too because then there's a fun game at the end of it. We all get to play a game, or, you know, 
uh, read true or false questions, or sometimes we've introduced candy or, or prizes if you feel like that's something your crowd could handle or that you'd be willing to do. Um, so this is just a fun way to use BeBot, even as a stress relieving activity, not an academic, <laughs> like explicit activity, just to sort of focus kids on robots as something that's accessible, something that we can do every day, and something that's very, very um, fun and engaging. So that was everything I wanted to share with you today. I'm really happy to stay on and continue to talk more about how we've used these kits and tools in our makerspace or other tools or um, settings that you might be considering for robotics in early childhood. I did wanna share with you uh, a few, a couple free resources. So first, the Code of Pillar Teacher Guide. Fisher-Price actually has put out a free teacher guide for all kinds of things you can do with Code of Pillar. I actually got a lot of ideas from, from reading it because Code of Pillar doesn't seem like you can do all that much with it, um, but they have come up with some pretty creative activities. And similarly, TTS, the company that makes Bebot, has put out a teacher guide. Now this teacher's guide is actually more like a website with lots and lots of resources because Bebot is um, actually part of a mandated early computing curriculum in the UK and a few other countries. So entire nation's worth of teachers have thought really long and hard about what are the coolest ways to introduce this tool in early childhood. So you can reap the benefit of all of their experience and expertise by exploring their teacher's guide website. Um, and actually, if we have time, I can actually paste some of the links that I've been sharing into the chat and I will stop sharing right and actually, yeah, I'll stop sharing. And if you guys have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Here are the teacher's guides. I know people are probably, it's the end of the day, so people are tired. <laughs> it's a Saturday, but if you're hanging with us and you wanna contribute, I would love to hear from folks how you are using, or if you are using these robots already, or what age group you work with. Um, I know a lot of people, I meet a lot of people in these kind of webinars who are saying, I've never done anything with early childhood and I didn't know you could. So I kind of just wanted to hear what you would share about that. Chat the free website, the Bebot emulator. And if you wanna stay in touch with me, I would love to hear from you guys um, after this conference, or if you're watching this as a recording, definitely please stay in touch with me on Twitter uh, at AL Straw Hacker, or uh, I encourage you to check out the webinar from my colleague, Dr. Amanda Sullivan. She's actually leading an unplugged uh, webinar right now for I Teach 808. And she and I work very closely together on a lot of robotic stuff. To get today, she was sharing some awesome ideas for how to engage STEAM without the technology, purely unplugged. Um, but she and I have worked a lot together and we are available. Doctors Amanda at Twitter. Okay, hi Kristen. She says we have Bebot in our third grade classroom. I'm going to check out the teacher guide for more ideas. Awesome. So Kristen, you might also be interested in those if you're if you're working with third graders with some of these tools. The Coda Pillar. Um, what I was talking about before the coordinate plane turning. That seems like something that your third graders would have a cool time making the connection. Um, and something else for older children that you might be interested in is, I don't know if you've come across Terrapin logo. It's actually, it's a really old <laughs> um, software and then a robotic kit, um, but it was sort of inspired the Bebot robot and a lot of similar robots, but they have um, a website version where you use these directional arrows. It's 
exactly the same kind of coding as a bbot, but they also have a function called pen down. And what that does is draw a line behind wherever your coding or, you know, robot animation is moving. So kids have made some really, really beautiful animated work, um, things like kaleidoscope flowers and landscapes just by coding where they want their robot to draw. So that's kind of a fun um, extension that third graders might like. And if you're curious about all of that work, I encourage you to check out Mindstorm's book by Seymour Pepper, who was sort of the, um, I guess I would call him the intellectual father of all this work. <laughs> he, he launched Logo. He um, was a, a researcher at MIT who studied with Jean Piaget, the developmentalist, and he actually came from a computer science background but really fell in love with the idea that children can learn through technology. And his seminal work has inspired the Mindstorms Lego kit and a lot of the robotic kits that you see on the market for education settings. So I hope you enjoy. <laughs> I finished quite early. <laughs> so if others have any other questions, um, we can continue to discuss Codepillar and Bebot. No next question. So, um, yeah, um, mahalo to Amanda Strawhacker and for everyone's participation. We hope that you find this or you will find this session helpful and make some valuable connections. Please help us complete the survey on the I Teach Italy website. I'll put a link in the chat. Um, the survey will also be sent to the email address you registered with. And please make sure to, sure to check any spam folders or your spam folder for any emails from itteach808hawaii at gmail.com. You'll be entered to win one of $25 Target gift cards. We complete the survey by February 4th. Thanks for being here today. Feel free to join us. Uh, I guess that's the last session. So uh, have a wonderful day. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs>